morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, thank you for coming to our first, uh, first of many listening sessions uh, designed to help us pull together a long-range plan here at Port Authority that meets the needs of everybody who would be using our system. Uh, I'm Catherine Kellerman. I am the CEO of the Port Authority here with our, uh, our planning team, and they will introduce themselves in a few minutes. You'll hear from our CFO. You'll hear from some of our outreach folks. IT as well for technology, thank you. We have a lot of information over the course of years of studies on shelves. What bridge should we look at? What tunnel should we look at? Uh, what road goes where? Where are people moving? What we don't have is the most important component, which are your thoughts about what's going on in your neighborhood, your city, your county, how you want to get from point A to point B, and how you see transportation changing in the future. What's going to be easier for you, not just next year, but in 25 years, if you could wave your magic wand and put together the transportation network, what would it look like? So we want to hear that from you. We'll talk to you today. We'll talk to you over the course of a couple weeks. Uh, we will come back a couple of times. First thing we want to do is share our information with you, make sure it looks good to you, and then get your thoughts on that. The next time you see us, We'll reconfirm that we were on the same page, make sure that we heard you the right way, and see if we're bringing you some solutions that meet what your expectations are and what your needs are. Today's conversation isn't just about where buses go or where trains would go. It's how you should interact with your fares, how you should interact with technology. Uh, and we take very strongly that for folks who have a harder time accessing our information, so folks who can't get to an internet connection, folks who don't have a flexible schedule so they can go to a meeting during the day, that it's harder for folks to get to service sometimes, it's harder for folks to get to these meetings. We, we're, we're recording, we'll be putting this on our website, uh, and we want to make sure that we're getting out to a lot of neighborhoods, and hearing from folks, getting all these different inputs, because our system is not a good system if it doesn't work for everyone. We deserve better than good, we deserve a great system, and that's one that hears from everybody, brings those needs together, and our communities get the service that they deserve. Uh, we run the service, but our communities own it, uh, so we're looking forward to this conversation, and I believe I am turning it over to David Huffaker at this point, our Chief Development Officer. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Uh, so as Catherine said, I'm David Huffaker, the Chief Development Officer for the Port Authority. So in my purview, I have our engineering and technical services teams. I have our long-range planning staff, uh, sustainability programs, and uh, some of our uh, accessibility and, and equity uh, programs, uh, transit-oriented communities, and then also our uh, service development uh, department, which includes the scheduling, service planning, uh, the uh, park and rides, stop locations, uh, shelters, uh, access paratransit. And uh, so I'm really excited to be here. I have to say, I'm kind of a pacer, so does anyone mind if I go down to the floor and walk around? I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna do that, thank you. Um, so I'm a pacer and uh, I've got to coordinate both hands, so that could be a, a challenge for me. Uh, so we'll keep me on task here. Um, so I, I'm putting up this map of the system that kind of shows uh, the system as it is today as well as uh, some of the routes that used to be there back in the past. The point is not where the lines are and, and trying to find a particular route, um, but uh, there are a couple things I take from this. And I'm, I'm relatively new to Pittsburgh. I, I moved here just over a year ago, and so I'm still learning my way around. I'm still learning some of the history. Uh, but some of the things that this map shows me are um, the long history of uh, transit in, in the Allegheny County area. Uh, we've got service that runs throughout the system. Many of it started on trolley routes and evolved into bus routes and then moved back into streetcar routes. And uh, so we've got service in, in, uh, with a long history. Uh, you can see it kind of looks organic. Um, it follows a lot of the contours of the, the land. And uh, it's um, a very complicated system. There are, over time, we've done a lot of extensions and variants and serving new communities that evolved and developed. And as budget constraints changed, got better or worse, we added service, we took service away. Uh, and our team did an amazing job uh, putting together a service plan that met as many people as we could. Um, however, 
it's a little tough to see here, but some of those faded lines, the, the lighter gray, represent some service that has been cut in the past 10 to 15 years. And so there are a lot of communities that no longer have any service, much less regular, fast, frequent, uh, high quality bus service that we would strive to give to everyone. So for me, it, it says that we've got a lot of work to do to put together a uh, system plan that works for all of Allegheny County. So to that end, uh, and one of the first challenges I got from Catherine when I started at Port Authority was to start working on a long-range plan, and I'm really excited to announce that we are beginning to do that. Um, we have uh, just embarked on a consultant contract with Michael Baker International to help us uh, put together a, a, a long-range system plan uh, with a horizon year of 2045. Uh, and what this plan will do is um, give us a vision statement for where the Port Authority needs to be, wants to be in 2045. Uh, what are some of the key corridors that, that require some additional focus and investment? Um, hopefully uh, give us some uh, list of projects that we can be working on, some high priority projects that will give us some prioritization uh, of those corridors that, that we will kind of knock out one by one. Um, so we're very excited to get going on this, and it's very good timing because there are a number of concurrent planning efforts underway, and uh, I think the time is right for um, the Port Authority to join in with our partners in the region uh, to uh, help uh, put together a well thought out system that works throughout all, all corridors in the county and beyond actually. So you can see uh, the Pittsburgh Downtown Partnership is working on a downtown mobility study in the Golden Triangle and, and kind of the fuzzy area around the triangle um, that represents downtown. And we're coordinating with the, the, the PDP on that uh, effort in terms of working on the uh, downtown routing of buses, what sort of uh, facilities need to be provided for customers, uh, transfer facilities, customer facilities, that sort of thing. Uh, then at the same time, uh, the Department of Mo Mobility and Infrastructure, DOMI, at the City of Pittsburgh is working on a 2070 vision plan. Uh, so it's working even further out into the future, um, but focused on all areas of the city. Uh, so it gives us an opportunity to kind of look at how our service interacts with some of the investments that DOMI is considering, whether it be street improvements, bike and other pedestrian improvements, certainly some, some help is needed on sidewalks, crosswalks, and the like. Uh, so we're an active participant with that effort as well. Uh, then you have the Port Authority Long Range Plan that, it, that essentially encompasses all of Allegheny County. Uh, so we're talking not just to the city of Pittsburgh, but as, as you will hear, we're going out to, to visit all areas of the county with this effort. And with our long range plan, we'll be talking to everyone from the airport, Finley, uh, over to the east side, Monroeville, and, and points east. We'll be talking to Tarentum and Brackenridge in the north, and uh, point south, uh, Fayette, and uh, Bethel Park, and, and uh, many of the communities throughout the area. Um, and then layered under all of this is the Southwestern Pennsylvania Commission which is the metropolitan planning organization for the region. So encompassing more than Allegheny County, it encompasses the counties outside of, of Allegheny County. They are also working on a long range plan. And the point of all this is we know about all these efforts, we're coordinating, we've got a meeting tomorrow that, that is gonna have all of the project teams together kind of uh, talking about where we have similar data requests, similar um, uh, concepts that we can work together on, where can we um, help each other out, and then where there are going to be areas where there's uh, maybe unique information that Port Authority is looking for that, that the other organizations might not be looking for. So uh, the, really is an exciting time here in uh, our territory because there are so many efforts underway. Um, and with them all working in lockstep right now, it's a great opportunity to coordinate at all levels of the experience. Uh, so that's, that's particularly exciting for us. So what's in the Port Authority Long Range Plan scope? 
Um, we've got a, a large amount of data gathering, as I just described. We'll be looking at our, where our ridership is today, where the jobs are forecast to be over the next 20 years, 25 years, um, and identifying some of those gaps that uh, uh, where, where we maybe are not serving people today, uh, maybe need to think about how are we going to handle some of the growth in the future, uh, what are some of the changes in travel patterns we expect. Um, so we're going to be looking at, at a lot of that data. Uh, probably the biggest piece of this whole planning effort is outreach. Um, the uh, team that we selected was uh, very strong in coming up with some creative ideas for how to engage with people, not just through public meetings like this, but through pop-up events, uh, places to give people a chance to, to touch service and, and have a, you know, maybe get to do something like paint their own transit lane or uh, work on um, uh, any sort of uh, hands-on efforts. Uh, and then also online and other uh, technology that, that allows us to uh, get people who we can't reach in other forms. The only time they have, maybe they work two or three jobs, and so they need to uh, access the system or access the information um, at, at a moment's notice in the middle of the night, and they'll be able to do that through some of the technology. Um, so as I talked about, we're identifying some of the gaps in the service. We'll also be identifying some of the investments that we want to make, whether it's additional uh, bus maintenance facilities, rail maintenance facilities, transit centers, additional park and rides, if that's the, the direction that we want to go. This is going to be um, a, a chance for the community to weigh in on what it is that we need to be focusing our investments on. Um, and then, of course, money is important. We'll be looking at funding opportunities and, and trying to come up with some creative ways to, to pay for some of these uh, investments that, that we think we'll be tasked with. Um, so what do we want from the public? And, and I, I probably should take a step back. We are literally right at the cuff. Just, just last week, we um, had our board approval of the consultant contract, so we haven't even had a kickoff meeting with the contractor. But we know that this is a great opportunity for us to reach out to a great cross-section of Allegheny County uh, through this outreach effort. So we've created a uh, feedback effort both uh, that you'll have in the, the back of the room here or actually out in the hallway uh, with a form. We're looking for feedback. We're looking for creative ideas. And I would emphasize, don't be constrained by what we do today or what, you know, don't, don't self-edit yourself. Put any idea out there. Let's be crazy because we're only going to come up with something great if we try out a whole bunch of ideas might have to filter some of them, but uh, it'll be a great opportunity for us to kind of think outside the box. We can, the box will be there. We'll come up with plenty of boxes, but we just need to come up with some of the great ideas that you have. So in addition to this form that'll be in the back of the room, there will be, you'll also be able to access it through the um, web, uh, web form that's available from this event. And then there will be many opportunities uh, for online engagement as well. So um, I am hopeful that you'll all take advantage of this. We need to hear your ideas. Um, and it, uh, I do want to emphasize this is not your only chance. We're going to be out often in the community. I'm hopeful that by the end of the year, you're tired of seeing my face. You're tired of seeing the planning team's face. And you say, let's just get on with it. So um, that's where I expect to be. Um, but this is just the beginning of what will be a conversation. So we're really excited to get going on that. Um, so what, what are you going to see over the next few months? Um, as I described, we're, we're working on the coordination with all of the other efforts. As I described, there's a meeting tomorrow with the project teams to uh, just kind of discuss the various scopes of work and see where there's some commonalities and where we can work together. Um, we'll be mobilizing the consultant team, and, and by that, that will be really defining, okay, what does the outreach program look like? What does the website look like? What, what's the branding for this long-range plan? That, that hasn't been determined yet. So there are um, any number of decisions that will kind of need to be fleshed out here over the next few months to get us going. Um, the uh, big thing is outreach. We, you will start to see a pretty robust outreach program. Uh, we'll be, over these next couple months, we'll be doing this conversation with the community throughout Allegheny County. 
but uh, there is much more to come and uh, you will see some focused outreach uh, specific to the long range plan starting up uh, later this year. Um, and then, and this is kind of my transition point, the early wins. Um, so 2045 may actually be a little disappointing to some. Well, that's great. I'm going to promise you great transit service in 2045, but what are you going to do for me tomorrow? So we are uh, working, and again, one of the things that attracted us to the Michael Baker team was their identification of a process to identify some early wins. Maybe there's some things we can try in the next month that would get us um, some improved transit experience. So um, they will be, and we are always looking for pilot programs, things that we can try out that will um, hopefully uh, bring some immediate improvement, uh, whether it's a, a route extension or a uh, improved uh, bus stop experience, what have you. Um, that's some of the things that we'll be working on identifying here. Um, the man who's tasked with some of that early win process is Philip St. Pierre. He's the Director of Service Planning. And I'm going to turn it over to him to talk about the process for um, the uh, extension of the service, how to make service request changes, and, and that sort of thing. Um, also, just a, a point on the logistics. So uh, I'm, I've talked, Philip's going to talk, Amy's going to talk about uh, the BRT project. And then we're going to have sort of a planning question and answer session. If anyone has some questions that they'd like to have in the whole group, uh, we'll have an opportunity to, to ask questions of the three of us. Uh, we will be available at the tables. We'll be mill milling around the room. So it's not your only chance to ask questions, but that'll give us a chance to sort of um, transition the room, if you will, to the next round of speakers. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Philip. Thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. I am Philip St. Pierre. I'm the Director of Service Development here at Port Authority. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about service planning um, and ways to collect feedback and, and, and give examples of some of the types of feedback that we're looking for today and on, and on an ongoing basis. While we are embarking on an endeavor to look uh, into the future, uh, what our service could look like in the year 2045, um, on a yearly basis, on a quarterly basis, we're implementing service plans uh, to improve our current service and try to provide uh, the most service that we can to the community. So on this graphic here, these are some, uh, some areas that go into, uh, in into service plans. Four times a year, we do service changes. Um, so uh, typically on a quarterly basis, you'll see uh, a public notice saying we're making modifications to a route. Um, we're typically trying to improve our on-time performance and our rely system reliability for our routes. Um, but there's a lot that goes into that behind the scenes on a quarterly basis to collect that information and Im implement those plans. Um, first off, we do a service evaluation. On a yearly basis, we, we take a look at our uh, current service and we look at the metrics and see how it's performing and what we could do better um, in the future to improve our services uh, for the community. Municipal coordination, we're talking to pen, uh, item, or entities like PennDOT, City of Pittsburgh, all the townships and boroughs that are doing comprehensive plans. Um, we're, we're collaborating with them and being advocates for, uh, for our passengers so that we can implement uh, services in those communities and make sure we have uh, accessible stops uh, for the for our services outreach you know we're here today doing public outreach uh, this is a good forum to collect feedback so that we could take that back and look at those uh, look at those topics and, and implement those into service plans but we also do in reach we do internal feedback with our operators and our customer service folks we're out in all our garages working with our operators and collecting feedback. There are eyes and ears out in the system, so we make sure to incorporate their, their concepts into our service plans. Customer feedback. We're, we're constantly uh, monitoring um, our comments that come through our customer service and looking for ideas and, and implementing the, uh, looking to implement those plans and looking at those. And obviously the long range plan, that's a big one that's, that we're taking on. But um, while that plan is looking into the future, there may be chunks of that plan that we can uh, implement in uh, short term uh, service plans. So let's talk about the service request process. There's multiple avenues uh, that, that you can submit uh, a request to us at Port Authority. Um, here today, you can obviously uh, uh, provide your comments. But even if you're not here today, uh, on a daily basis, you can call customer service and say, I'd like to see this, I'd like to see that, I wish Port Authority uh, would make a modification to this route. 
please contact customer service so that we can, can collect that feedback and look at those uh, plans. You can also do it through our website. The easiest uh, way is to go to portauthority.org and do a search uh, for service requests and you'll be able to find the link and you'll be able to uh, input your comments and those go directly to us. On an annual basis, we evaluate all those requests. Uh, we evaluate it on the three pillar, pillars uh, here on uh, efficiency, effectiveness, and equity. Efficiency is maximizing uh, the services to, uh, to maximize the passengers per ser service hour. The effectiveness is maximizing the community's access to effective transit for or origin and destinations. And equity is making sure that we're providing services to those populations that may have a greater need for our transit service. On an annual basis, we, pr we produce this document, an annual service report. Uh, it can't, you can uh, access this document online. Uh, portauthority.org. Um, it has an evaluation of our current services. So we look at our services, what's performing well, what's not performing well, and we start developing plans on how we can improve those services. Also, all the service requests that come in, we evaluate those and we, and we rank them based on the efficiency, effectiveness, and equity. So you'll see a ranking of those requests. Once we have a list of all these requests and, uh, and all the uh, service evaluation, we're going to develop a public outreach plan and go to those communities with uh, developed plans so that we can t uh, take those to the community and find out if those plans are going to meet the needs of that community. Once we hear feedback from the community, we're going to get those ideas and put them into the budget request. So we're going to ask finance and our folks uh, and the board to see if we can get more money for, for those services. If, if the budget is approved with the additional service changes, we'll go ahead and uh, work on getting those resources. Whether it's we need to get more buses, we need to hire more operators, um, we need to get uh, infrastructure for bus stops in place for new routes. Um, so we have to, we, you know, it takes time to get those resources in place after we get the budget request. And then we work on implementing that service plan. So that's kind of the life cycle of a request and how it gets into uh, a service plan. So here's an example of some of the some of the feedback we're looking today. And this this list is not all inclusive. If there's anything that you'd like to talk to us about today, please feel free to uh, talk to us about that. Um, what we're looking for today is where would you like to see service? What some what are some origins and destinations that you would like to see served uh, by our by our transit system? Please let us know what kind of hours and days you'd like to see service. Whether it's daily service, weekend service, later night service. Uh, please let us know. Um, Obviously, we're looking for feedback on our current services. What can we do better? Um, On-time performance is a big initiative for us in our service to planning department. Um, so we're really working on improving our service reliability and our on-time performance. Overcrowding is an issue. Um, so we want to make sure that we're uh, building plans that, that our vehicles complement our service. Our frequencies can complement our service. Um, so we'd like to hear about where you're experiencing overcrowding on the bus. Travel times, are your travel times taking too long to get to your destinations? Could you see improvements in travel times? Uh, connections, are you trying to make a transfer from one route to another? Let us know so we can take a look at those connections and see if we can improve. Span of service, if you'd like to see later service, um, please let us know and that feeds into, you know, we've been talking about how can we provide more service late night and on weekends uh, to, the, to all communities that need to access the service. Park and ride suggestions. Um, we know that a lot of our park and rides are, are near capacity or at capacity. So please let us know if there's, if there's an area that we should look for in, in possibly getting new park and rides out into the system. Bus stop locations. Um, please let us know, um, you know where you'd like to see bus stops. Um, we, this year we developed the bus stop and street design guidelines. It's a good resource. You can find that on our portauthority.org website. But that, uh, document outlines everything that goes into an adequate, a safe, and accessible bus stop. So please, you know, feel free to, uh, but let us know where you'd like to see bus stops and then we use this guide to help us determine if a bus stop is safe and accessible at these locations. Bus stop infrastructure, if you'd like to see more shelters, uh, where would you like to see shelters, lighting, accessibility, uh, please let us know that so that we could take a look at that and work with our municipal partners like the city and the townships and the boroughs. Um, because a lot of these places we don't own the right of way. So we rely on those partnerships out in the community to say, hey, we have a community need here. Uh, let's work together and see if we can improve our bus stop and accessibility to the routes. 
uh, service information. Uh, service development, uh, in service development, we build the timetables. We do the head signs on the bus routes. If there's anything that we can do to improve that information, getting it to the public, please let us know. Um, if you'd like to see something different on our timetables, anything that we can change or make it easier uh, to recognize uh, what our services are and how we provide them, please let us know. So again, those are just examples that, of some of the feedback that we're looking for today. Um, and again, that this list is not in, all inclusive, but please, um, you know, we are going to have a Q&A session after this. We have a table out back. Uh, we have paper forms, an online form. Please provide us your feedback, and we look forward to hearing from you. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Amy to, to discuss the uh, BRT. Thanks, Philip. Oh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Amy Silberman. I'm the Director of Planning here at Port Authority. Thanks so much for coming out and joining us on this somewhat slightly snowy morning. Um, so how many folks have heard a presentation on our bus rapid transit project before? OK, so some folks are new. If you have heard it before, this is going to be a really high level overview because we have a lot of different topics to touch on today. We don't want to spend too much time on any one. There's a lot more detail that I'm not going to get into today, but um, just be uh, aware that we have a lot more information out at our desk, uh, at the table, outside the room here, and then uh, we are also going to be having additional community meetings just to talk about this project as it gets closer to fruition. Uh, so what is the Bus Rapid Transit Project? So for those of you who have not been to one of our presentations on this before. Uh, first, it is a partnership project. This is not just Port Authority's project. It's actually a collaboration project between the Port Authority, the City of Pittsburgh, Allegheny County, and the Urban Redevelopment Authority. So it's a bit unique in that. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of us involved. Um, and really, it's an infrastructure project that is focused on increasing reliability in the corridor between downtown Pittsburgh Oakland and then neighborhoods east of Oakland and then heading out all the way into the Mon Valley. Uh, this is our highest ridership corridor in all of Allegheny County. We have something like 37,000 people riding buses in and around Oakland every weekday. Uh, that's higher than our entire light rail system combined. So there's a lot of people moving in and around Oakland. Uh, and there isn't any dedicated transit infrastructure for them right now. So what that means is that buses are slow, or not even so much that they are slow all the time, but they can be very slow or they can be fast on some days. But the reliability of that service is very poor. Uh, so someone doesn't know if it's going to take them 15 minutes to get to work or school or home or if it's going to take you an hour. So this project is really looking to put in some physical improvements into the street network to really prioritize transit in this corridor. So what that means is we are looking to create a few things and we're looking to update a few things. We're looking to create bus only lanes on 5th and Forbes avenues between downtown Pittsburgh and Oakland. And we're looking to add transit shelters at every stop along that corridor, uh, as well as amenities at those shelters, things like ticket vending machines, real-time signage so you know when your bus is coming. Uh, so really an improved experience while you're waiting for your bus. Uh, and then also protected bicycle infrastructure. It's very important to the city of Pittsburgh, who's a partner on this project, that we not only have uh, dedicated space for transit, but we also have dedicated space for cyclists. Uh, that's obviously a, a safety uh, issue as well. And then we're looking to update several things in the corridor as well. We're looking to update traffic signals. Uh, and some of that work is being done in conjunction with PennDOT as well. And those traffic signals will be smart traffic signals. So they'll actually be able to recognize when a bus is coming and be able to give that bus a little bit of an extended green light or a bit of an early green light to help prioritize and move those buses through the corridor uh, more quickly. And then we're also looking to update all of the sidewalks and crosswalks that are immediately adjacent to all of the BRT stations and stops along the corridor to make sure that whether or not you're using transit, you have a safe and easy way to walk around the neighborhood and to cross the street. Uh, and if you're wheeling something, you're wheeling yourself, you're wheeling your kid, you're wheeling your groceries, uh, that we have not, lots of nice curb cuts and uh, make it really easy to get around. So where will the BRT go? Let's see if the laser, oh, the laser works good. Uh, usually the laser doesn't work. So this is a big map. Uh, there's a lot of stuff on the map. And the BRT uh, project is a little bit complicated. It's not one line connecting two places. It's actually going to uh, com be comprised of five different bus routes. But sort of what we call the core area is here in this red box. 
So in this red box, we have downtown Pittsburgh, here where my laser is. We have the uptown neighborhood, and then we have the Oakland neighborhood. And in that red box is where we're looking at putting a bus lane on 5th and Forbes Avenues on the right side of the street, so the side where the doors are, so people get on and off the bus, uh, on those two streets. So outbound towards Oakland on Forbes Avenue and inbound towards downtown on 5th Avenue. This is also the area that will have protected bicycle infrastructure for people who are cycling. Outside of that area, you will notice uh, we've got lots of little orange dots on the map here. This represents where the BRT stops and stations are going to be located. So you'll notice that the stations are not only in this red box, they actually continue all the way out Forbes Avenue into the Squirrel Hill neighborhood and then all the way through the Greenfield neighborhood. And then they also continue out Fifth Avenue through the Shady Side and East Liberty neighborhoods and up into Highland Park. Um, so we have a few different bus routes that are operating on these corridors, but there's sort of a few different levels of infrastructure improvements. Once you get out of the red box, there's no longer transit lanes. Those roads aren't really wide enough to have bus only lanes and still accommodate the existing traffic. Uh, but we will have those upgraded stops and shelters and amenities. There's actually going to be five bus routes that are going to operate this bus rapid transit service. That's the P3 route, which is the Oakland East Busway route today. Uh, that route is proposed to be uh, shortened on its outer end. It currently goes all the way out the East Busway, which is this purple line here. It goes all the way out the East Busway to Swissville Station right now. It's proposed to uh, be shortened on its outer end to start at Wilkinsburg. Then it will travel along the East Busway and then cut into Oakland and actually be extended all the way into downtown Pittsburgh. And then the other four routes uh, uh, are going to mirror their existing routing today. That is the 61 A, B, and C routes. The A and B uh, head out through Squirrel Hill into the Regent Square, Wilkinsburg, Edgewood, Swissvale, and then they uh, end down in Braddock and North Braddock. And then the 61C goes through Greenfield, and then it goes all the way down, uh, crosses the river, goes into Homestead, Duquesne, and ends finally in McKeesport. Uh, so those three routes will sort of operate on this uh, Squirrel Hill branch. Uh, of this BRT network. And then the final route is the 71B route, and that's the existing route today that continues out Fifth Avenue and then goes up Highland Avenue into Highland Park. There are four routes that are also going to be changed as part of this project, uh, and they're listed on the bottom of the slide here. Those are the 61D, the 71A, C, and D. All four of those routes are proposed to terminate in Oakland on their inner end and no longer come all the way here into downtown Pittsburgh. The reason those four routes uh, were selected for those of you who uh, have not been involved in the planning process for this uh, is because those four routes actually have other routes alongside them that take people directly to downtown Pittsburgh. Uh, so re removing those routes from the uptown and downtown neighborhoods helps us clean up the bus volumes a little bit so the buses don't get quite so bunched up. Uh, helps us create sort of what we call even headways or even space between the bus so people are waiting for a known amount of time. Uh, and also allows people to still get into downtown if that's their final destination via one of the other routes. So how much is this project going to cost? Uh, so we're looking at a project cost right now of $225 million. Uh, and this is sort of a pie chart of the breakdown of where that money is going. So there's a lot of different pieces to this project. Uh, we have things like street elements and, and guideway elements. That's things like uh, painting the streets, uh, updating curb uh, work. We're going to be adding some more curbs, making some sidewalks bigger in certain areas. Uh, and things called bump outs, which help reduce the distance for people to cross on a crosswalk. 7% uh, going to the stations themselves, those are the, the shelters, the structures, uh, ticket vending machines, real-time arrival signage, uh, some support facilities. We have a layover facility in this project proposed to be in Oakland for our buses uh, before they begin their route. We have some construction work. That's a big chunk of this project cost. Uh, we have systems like our machines and our security cameras and uh, emergency call buttons and things like that. Uh, ROW here stands for right of way and land. We have a few little areas where we actually need to uh, purchase some little slivers of property for the city of Pittsburgh to expand the road width very slightly. These are very, very tiny uh, areas. I think the longest is like half a block long in one area. We have vehicles that we need to purchase for this project. So we are going to have all 60 foot articulated buses on the BRT. Those are the bendy buses that bend in the middle. Um, and we are also proposing right now to purchase some battery electric buses as part of this project to operate on the corridor. Uh, 
The last two pieces, uh, one is professional services. Those are all of our engineers, our project managers, uh, who are behind the scenes now working on all these design drawings and measuring everything, make sure we're gonna build it right. And then finally, uh, contingency, that's for things that we don't expect to happen that can happen uh, when we open up streets or change curbs and some of these streets are rather old. Uh, so some of them might have some unexpected things uh, as we move through construction. So $225 million, how are we going to pay for it? This is what it's going to. How are we going to get this money? Uh, the project payment uh, breakdown is here. The biggest chunk of how we're proposing to pay for the project is through a federal grant uh, called Small Starts. Uh, we're proposing to get just under $100 million of the project from that grant. Uh, that grant, we've been resubmitting it every year so that we stay in the queue. How that grant works is once we have all of our other sources of funding lined up, uh, we hope the federal government will then give us our money. The, the project has been rated highly by the federal government. It's one of only four projects uh, in last year's queue that got a high rating. Uh, so we're very feeling very promise, uh, very hopeful about getting that grant, but we have to line up all of our other sources of funding first. Uh, we're looking at a variety of other local sources of funding for the other pieces uh, of this project. We have some grants out through um, some, there are some state grant programs, some local grant programs. Uh, some of those are coming from the county, some from the city. Port Authority uh, itself pledged, uh, I believe, 23 million of its capital budget this year to support the project. Uh, and then we were still working on the last 12% and securing that through a variety of other uh, small grants and potentially other uh, local contributions from the project partners. Uh, and then some other federal dollars, those mostly come in in the form of the vehicles that we need to purchase. The federal government subsidizes uh, us when we purchase buses. So what's the timeline? When is this going to happen? So right now we are just in 2020. Uh, so we are entering final design for this project, uh, which means we're getting really into the nitty gritty of the design details, the measurements, all of the engineering work. Um, we have our 60% design is up on our websites. So if you wanna look at what a street is proposed to look like, you're welcome to do that. We'll also be up, uh, updating those in the coming months here. Uh, with some uh, updates from 60% since we're moving into what's called 100% design. Um, we're going to have some more public engagement soon, hopefully this spring, uh, latest this summer, to look at station designs. Uh, some of you uh, were uh, uh, generous enough to give us your feedback on some initial design concepts that we put out uh, on our website in the fall. We got about 1,500 responses from that, so that was great. And so our design team is taking all of that feedback into account, coming up with some actual station designs that we're gonna then come back out to you all uh, and kind of get your way in on those. Uh, so through 2020, we're gonna finish the design. It'll be all buttoned up by the end of the year. That's the plan. In 2021, we will then begin construction on the project, assuming all of those sources of funding uh, come to fruition by the end of this year. That construction will be about a 24-month construction process. So it'll begin in 2021 and wrap up in 2023. Uh, and then we're hoping to get those battery electric buses in in 2023 and begin service in 2023. So, and then uh, if you do have any comments or thoughts, we have uh, folks sitting at the table uh, out in the hallway, or if you just go to portauthority.org slash BRT, that's the project website. That's where you can find maps and uh, design drawings and all sorts of information about the project and give us any uh, feedback or comments or thoughts that you have that you don't want to share with the full group today. Uh, and I think with that, I'll leave you with a beautiful picture of what we hope Fifth Avenue uh, looking inbound, so looking towards downtown Pittsburgh will look like. This is at the University of Pittsburgh. It's at the corner of Tennyson Avenue and Fifth Ave. Uh, so this is our proposed Tennyson station area. You see the bus lane uh, on the right there, it's dashed because in this particular area, we'll actually also uh, allow cars making a right to turn there. So it sort of signals to the cars that it's okay for them to come into the bus lane uh, and make that right turn. And then on the left, you see in green, there is a raised up bike lane uh, up at sidewalk level uh, to protect cyclists as well. Hi, my name, <clears throat> excuse me. My name is Paul Gort and I was wondering for the cyclists, what are you gonna, going to do to protect the cyclists that are on these roadways because I was downtown and I almost got hit by a car when it flew through the bicycle lane. Yeah, great question. So as part of the BRT project, the sort of scope of area that we're looking at protected bicycle facilities or separated bicycle facilities um, will be from uh, the Crosstown Boulevard in Uptown, so sort of the edge of downtown and Uptown all the way through 
uptown on Fifth and Forbes okay. Avenues, and then all the way through Oakland. Um, in Oakland, like you can see in the image here, our current, we currently have a contraflow or sort of a backwards running bus lane on Fifth okay. Avenue, if you can picture that. That's going to turn into a two way bicycle path, and that will be physically separated from the general traffic lane. Okay, and I was just wondering are you going to have like security cameras to catch these people if they fly right through a bicycle lane? Because we need more security cameras to watch for these drivers who don't care about the cyclists, they rather care about getting where they need to go. Sure, so that's probably a better comment that we could address with the city of Pittsburgh and I'll certainly pass that along to them okay, as, as a concern. Um, but just a note that in Oakland and in Uptown, that bike lane will be physically separated by a barrier. So it's not okay. just gonna be a line of paint, it will be a physical curb so okay. that a car would literally have to jump over the curb. Uh, not that that couldn't be done or hasn't happened before, uh, yeah. but we're certainly trying to prevent that through the design as much as possible. Possible. Enforcement is another issue, but certainly I'll pass that okay, along to our and partners. Also, I have another question. Now, I actually get funding from my Connect card through my agency, and my question is, is this going to be for people that live in supported housing like I am? The question is, is this going to be budget for us, where we're on a strict budget and we pay for a whole year's worth of bus ride, mm -hmm. is this gonna skyrocket? Because if that happens, then my agency might not pay for the bus pass. Sure, so I think there's two pieces that are answers to that question, or somewhat answers to that question. The first piece is that we're not proposing any different fare structure for the bus rapid transit okay. project. So whatever our fare structure is in 2023, right now is what we're proposing the BRT be. So okay. it's just a is, simple. Is that going to, relay over to the trolley line? Um, right, so the second part of the answer to my question, which should help you with this part, is that we're gonna have a presentation in a few minutes by Peter Shank, our chief financial officer, who's okay. gonna be talking about what our fare options in general look like in the future. So okay. that won't be specific to the bus rapid transit project. It will just be for Port Authority wide. So there is gonna be an opportunity today to hear about some choices and to give feedback uh, on things about fare structures that we as a community would like to see for the future. Okay, thank you for your and time. And if I can, thank you, that was a great answer, Amy. And if I can chime in on that, we are going to be talking about fares, but from the perspective of how passengers want to interact, we're not proposing a change. BRT is a nicer part of the system. In my perfect world, everything would run like that, so the fare stays the same. We would keep the trolleys at the same fare, too. I know we previously had zone-based, and we got away from that, so we don't, want it to, we don't want to get to any kind of change at any service costs more than something else. We do want to get your ideas about how fares could be easier for you, so I don't want to steal all of Pete's thunder, but we hear a lot from folks, you know, having to pay more for a transfer is not, it's not fair, it's a pain. Well, help us understand what would make more sense, because if you're paying cash, we don't want you in a place where you're constantly paying more at the fare box, so what's an easier way to do that? Is there, you, you can make it easier to get to a day pass, is it easier to get to a card, is it you're, you're tapping and now you can ride wherever you want for four hours, tell us what that looks like for you. Um, our fare recovery right now is about 21%. So we're going to take your input, pull that together with a fare study. We've got all these options to price out and try to pull a system where we maybe land at the 20%, might be more, might be less. Then we bring it back out and make sure that we heard you, right? Um, so you know, I would say today, do not sweat it. And as long as, I, I think, yeah, just don't sweat it. But tell us what would be easier for fares. And then I'm going to turn it back over to the planning folks. Fair recovery. So how much of what our budget is comes in at the fare box? It's your user fee at the fare box. Everyone in this room, somehow you're paying a tax, right? Whether you go shopping, whether you pay rent that turns into someone else's property tax. So nobody in this room is only paying at the fare box. I really want to stress that we feel strongly about that. What we get at the fare box is about 21% of our budget. The other 79% our finance team. Pete's like, she's taking my whole presentation. Um, <laughs> the finance team will go through the other funding sources. We get a lot from state funding. We get federal funding. But everyone in here is paying those tax dollars. It's your money coming back in. So it's fair recovery. It's not you're only paying 21%. I want to clarify that. Back to planning. Pretty robust. 
robust um, community engagement strategy. I'm just wondering if you have a plan in place for evaluation, how you know if that strategy is working and who you're reaching and, and if that's been an effective strategy. That's great. So um, I will say at this point, we still have not had a chance to work with our uh, consultant team and, our, and the project team uh, to identify those success factors. So that would be a great input point for us to kind of give us some, some things that we can use to judge, did we successfully reach people? So help us define what that means so that we don't tell you, well, we, we met everyone that we needed to meet. If you're feeling like we haven't uh, reached everyone or there are specific groups that we should be talking to, that would be great information for us to, to incorporate as we're planning. Great. Thank you. If anyone else has questions, feel free to go up and if you need assistance, just raise your hand and I'll bring the mic to you. Good morning. Thank you, Port Authority, for um, an SPC and the media for having these meetings today but the public most of the public and trust me after renting cars off and on since april you folks are failing us the back jams of i mean the backlog of traffic along old and new 28 coxcomb hill pin hills plum borough from the heart here of the city out is horrific. And the back of this building, respectfully, and please let me get this out because this is important as this is being videoed. Because I have some of your drivers and out of, out of respect, I do not want to mention their names, but this stuff needs to get out. As I'm putting stuff out on Facebook, I'm not lying. My eyes don't lie. I have gone through health issues almost dying from uh, infancy up to where I'm at now. And what I have learned since 96 was the railroad canals that sit, that sat on this property where Amtrak Greyhound is on out and how SPC tore these regions apart is ridiculous. You folks are wrongly allowing 266 monthly trips to and from downtown here uh, to our county lines where we have federally and state forest parks down through county parks as the oversight committee has never kept up never made in deep improvements that need to be made on this line over here at Amtrak Greyhound, we have seven lines. If you look up on Google, lost Pittsburgh passenger trains, the first seven lines pulled out of this property here. The Eastern Division was destroyed where there were two aqueducts on the back end of the exit of this building's garage. The line led up in the Beaver County Homewood Yard Going over 18, Beaver County Transit Authority, Midvon Valley, I mean, Beaver County Transit Authority, Newcastle Area Transit Authority. On up into the northwest, northeastern, southern Alleghenies, wrapping back into the whole SPC, Southwestern Pennsylvania Planning Commission's area. When you folks started pushing BRT with going out using the current P1, P2, P3. Stage one goes from downtown here to Hayes Ramp. Stage two goes out the old Hawkins Station that we call the second where the loop is out in Swissville, Rankin area. We badly need to get stage three pushed into Pitt Karen Yard. I walk that area. I have asked Port Authority to sit down with me, go over these pictures, walk with me while I was trespassing to get these pictures and learning where these stations are. None of you have taken me up on these requests. You're asking for us to go on. And by the way, with me being on the Allegheny County Transit Council, ACTC, which is permitted through the walls of Harrisburg's capital, 
and our Pennsylvania Transportation Committee, which I had to that night with the rep in Altoona that was asked, that we were asked to get our voices heard. When I bust in on the P-10, which a young man and his loving wife is trying to get service back up into Harrison from Locke and Corbett up along the Connemon line up into Harrison. That's not good enough. You need to deal with the 266 monthly trips that are overlapping with the Port, Port Authority's work from the heart of downtown here out to our county lines. We need hubs. We need transfer points set up. And I don't, I don't, let me rephrase that. <laughs> I don't care what Darius Jones, Port Authority worker, I don't care what Howard E-H-R-I-C-H man says. I have been verbally put down about my behavior, which I have stopped getting into trouble. I have been hey, working to get my behavior straightened out. Let's but wrap up. through all this, regrouping, we need those 266 monthly trips to, re, to be pulled out of downtown Pittsburgh back to our county lines with hubs and transfer points to be able to reach and better those counties of Lawrence, Beaver, Washington, Fayette, and Westmoreland counties. Westmoreland County is the worst out of the SPC system. They need to connect with Indigo and also to start connecting so that Indigo and the others can connect with the other smaller class three, fours, and fives. Hey, Jim, let's, let's give them a minute to maybe respond to some of the thoughts that they may have about some of our connections that might, we might be considering down the, down the line and then give somebody else a chance to ask yes. a question. I'm sure. sorry. Yeah, thank you. I, and I think you bring up a couple interesting points around the uh, transit centers, some of the connections, and also how we're going to connect to counties outside of Allegheny. Uh, and that's where we're going to look to our partners at SPC and work with them on uh, some of their ideas for, for some of those uh, cross-county connections. Um, but certainly making use of all of the infrastructure that's in play uh, today uh, is something that, that we're going to be looking at as part of this long-range plan. Correct, and I accept that, but one real quick thing more, Jimmy. Um, I got hurt up at Seven Springs working as a job temp on the 18th. Um, and I knew that Myers, they cut the, uh, the commute between Slippery Rock into Pittsburgh here, and Butler, had, Butler Area Transit Authority had to uh, severely work hard to do what they're doing, pulling in downtown, what they're overlapping. But with the overlapping of any of those six systems that are overlapping Port Authority's work, it should be Newcastle and but um, Newcastle and Butler, Butler systems. Uh, we need a connection between Butler Sheets in Butler, Ford City, possibly Walmart in West Catani, and um, Westmoreland Transit Authority badly needs to redo their runs, especially the 14J, because all you folks with a staff member in the room here that works for Port Authority, him and his loving wife, I live up in County Sheldon, Allegheny County Housing Authority, Sheldon Park. Um, despite what some of the operators and transit fans are saying, we have not adjusted. When I was in Shelter, I was out there. You know what I have done as a volunteer on ACTC. When I got out of Shelter and I was placed up to Allegheny County Housing Authority, Sheldon Park, which is at Old Freeport Road in Spring Hill, mm -hmm. we, we have been cut since Harmer Garage was wrongly shut down. But at the same time, with Seven Springs being low income, with eight, only $825.10 per month with the three checks, SAD, SSI, and the state supplement. That's not much, but when... Hey, Jim, let's wrap up. Uh, uh, yes, sir. But yet, whenever you have Westmoreland Transit Authority's 81620F looping and meeting the Vayette connector, and all these other trips, the 266 trips, wrongly being allowed to pull from downtown here out, why aren't we utilizing 
seven spring service. You got bike trails going out. Hey, Jim. So let's give know, somebody else a chance. I would like to speak with somebody in planning and SPC. We can talk with you afterward, and there's people out in the hallway. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Jim. All right. Thank you. Please. Good morning, folks. Good morning. My name is Drew Levitt. Just uh, recently moved here, actually. I have two quick questions, one predominantly for Philip and the other mostly for Amy and David. Uh, Philip, in terms of near-term wins on the LRTP, and I know this may be premature because you're just getting into it, do you have a sense on the balance between uh, expanding your coverage area through new routes versus expanding uh, essentially productivity through improved headways on existing routes? Yeah, there's there's definitely um, some ideas that, we, that we're, we're, we're working through and looking at. I mean, we're, we're evaluating our current system and seeing what's performing well, what's not performing well. Um, you know, so we're looking at if things aren't performing well, why aren't they performing well? Do we need to get out in the community, market the service, or maybe it's just a service that it's just it won't it won't grow. Maybe we can better utilize those resources somewhere else, like a, um, like weekend service or later night service on other other routes. Um, looking at looking at different ways to connect communities and and you know, the, our, we have a very downtown centric focused network. Um, I'd like to be able to, I know, I, some of the meetings that we've gone to, some folks, communities would like to just get around in their community, not necessarily commute to downtown. So um, in our transit service areas, we have different complements of, of service types. You know, we have local routes, coverage routes, uh, commuter express routes, rapid routes. So um, typically, the, uh, you know, that type of service may fall under one of those four categories, um, but I think Different communities need different needs, um, whether you know having that peak commuter uh, type service, maybe um, overlaid with maybe some local service just so folks can get around in their communities, um, and maybe uh, coverage routes just to connect points that um, typically aren't connected. So we have to look at our complement and how we do that. Um, I know in this community that our, the way our fare structures are that, that we typically um, shy away from transfers. Um, so going through this fare study, it will, be, it will be interesting to hear the feedback from the public on different fare concepts because I think that will, um, you know, depending on what comes out of that plan, may help open up some doors on how we service plan, which also will feed into how we uh, look at long-range uh, service. Okay. And, and actually, uh, along those lines, <coughs> sorry, Amy, okay. um, uh, starting in March, we will be expanding some of our routes that have five-day-a-week weekday service. We're going to be adding some Saturdays, some Sunday service as well. I think one of the things that we've seen and, and from my experience at, at other agencies is having that seven-day coverage sometimes is a, a key catalyst to increasing ridership all days of the week because it gives people a more regular way to connect uh, and people don't just have Monday through Friday jobs. And so this is an opportunity to provide some of those connections as well. So we'll have kind of a real-time laboratory, if you will, to see how the ridership, both in the weekday, um, but also in some of the, the new uh, days of service, Saturdays and Sundays, that we're going to be adding in March. I was just going to add a quick note that um, through the long range plan, one of the goals in the initial round of public engagement that we're going to be doing will focus on sort of priority uh, from the community. What is more important to people? And I think when we start to build that long range plan, that will really anchor us in that. So right now what we do is fairly well balanced between sort of what we what we term equity and what we term efficiency in looking equity is more focused on coverage and, and populations that have greater need for, for mobility services. Um, whereas efficiency is really about, you know, getting as many people on that bus as we can. Um, but I think we're going to hear a lot from the community through that long-range planning process, and that can help sort of drive a, a roadmap for what Philip's doing in the shorter term, but with sort of a 2045 goal of, of getting to some ultimate end. Yeah, great. Um, one comment on that, and then a second question. So the comment, of course, that there is a relationship, obviously, between fare policy and frequency policy as well. Like, it's not just that you might have to pay an additional cash fare, but also you might have to wait 20 or 30 minutes for that connection. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second one as well, uh, I'm excited to hear that you chose Michael Baker for largely for this, their strength of their outreach strategies. But, you know, obviously the folks in the room today are not necessarily fully representative of the racial and ethnic diversity that this county and the city has. Uh, so I'm excited to hear a little bit as you continue to develop the LRDP yeah. about, or TP rather, about uh, your equitable outreach strategy. 
Yeah, and I, I can speak a little bit to that too. And one of the one of the reasons that we chose Michael Baker is because they had some very unique um, uh, proposals in their in their larger proposal, some sort of micro engagement strategies. So things like actually riding the bus and, and doing engagement with people on the bus, doing engagement with people at bus stops. So you know, a lot of people don't have time to come out to a community meeting or it's not the right time of the day for them or they have to take an hour of two buses to get there and back. Um, so we we did, you know, one of the reasons we really selected them was because of their sort of unique approach to making sure that we were touching on all of these, you know, facets of our existing customer base um, that we probably don't hear from enough. So. And, and in, in addition to that, also reaching those people who don't ride the service today, whether they can't get to the service or have chosen not to because of other reasons. So the part of their team is also very strong with uh, some of the background information research we've been doing on both riders, but also maybe even more importantly, non-riders to find out what are some of the barriers keeping them from being able to, to get on the service. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Yes. Hello. Um, hi. My hi. name's uh, Barb Warwick. I'm here for the Greenfield Community Association, or the Transportation Development Committee. I have some specific questions I'll take out there. But just um, mm -hmm. overall, um, I, I wanted to ask, so um, <clears throat> from my perspective, um, you know, Bus service is the core of public transit in a city like Pittsburgh. Um, you know, building a subway system or whatever is not necessarily realistic. Um, and in terms of growth and making the city, you know, an attractive place to live, it would seem to me that uh, the goal should be um, making it so that it is simply easier and more convenient, more pleasurable to take the bus than to get in your car, right? I assume that's yeah. also that's, your that's, <laughs> yes. take We agree, yes. Yeah. Right. Um, but I feel like as a city, we have a problem in that our mayor does not seem to have the same viewpoint. Um, through um, organizations like Domi in particular, you know, he has big ideas about improving transit that are intended to serve businesses and potential future residents some examples are um, shuttle service that he wants to run through Shenley Park. Um, another, there was just a recent article about he's excited about gondolas going up and down the hills. I mean, this is, this is something for ski resorts and, and amusement parks, right? This, th these are not transit solutions. Um, and should they, and should these projects begin, they cost, an, an, I mean, enormous amount of money. Um, but my understanding is that there's sort of a, I don't know if it's a wall or a disconnect between funding for Pat and, you know, Domi, et cetera, but what, what is your strategy for bringing them, for sort of helping the mayor see that just because there's no ribbon cutting ceremony for extended bus service, you know, just because there's no awards and accolades and fancy dinners because, you know, I, you know, I can get on the bus every 15 minutes instead of every half an hour. That's what we need. That's what the people of Pittsburgh need today. The mayor doesn't see it that way. So what are you doing to try and get him on board? If I can make an initial comment about that, I, I, I think, so Port Authority's prior long range plan, uh, which was for the year 2020, uh, was not done by Port Authority. It was done with Port Authority in partnership with the Southwestern Pennsylvania Commission. We have had no plan since then, and I believe that plan was completed in 2004, uh, if I'm correct. So I think one of the reasons why the city continues to push for um, some of these transit solutions is because they haven't felt like Port Authority has necessarily shown that roadmap of how we're going to get there. So I think the two planning efforts that are underway right now simultaneously, Domi's 2070 vision plan and Port Authority's long range plan are going to be really critical in ensuring that our two entities are very well aligned and have a really clear vision for who and how and why we're operating different services in the future. And one of those services might be gondolas. There are certainly gondolas in, in other cities that are uh, successful public transit examples. Um, I think the bigger questions are who operates them, why, what's more efficient, what's better for the community, and I think that's really where we need to get as much input from the community as possible. So if you, you know, as a resident, 
feel that that's something that you think Port Authority should operate, that's great feedback for us. Um, there might be others who feel feel otherwise. Or maybe it's that, hey, you know, in 2070, maybe this is a good plan to put a, you know, a new incline somewhere or a gondola or ferries or whatever. And we're going to be looking at all that with the long range plan too. I, I think the when we're thinking about things really long term, um, I, I don't want us to be constrained by what we have today. But I do think that once that long range plan is done, then we need to back up from that and figure out the clear roadmap for how we get there. Because really, the simplest answer to that I think you already spoke of is that we all want great, frequent, you know, timely, good amenity bus service um, on all of our streets or in all of our neighborhoods so that we can get to where we want to go in a reasonable amount of time. Um, but who knows what that looks like in 2070? Maybe there isn't a bus in 2070. Um, so you know, I think there's I think there's two levels to it. I guess I'm not as concerned about 2070 as I'm about today. Yeah. Um, and I understand it's not necessarily you. It's a funding issue. So I mean, there's I mean, I can you know just now this shuttle. Part, I know we've spoken about it before. We're talking 10 to 20 million dollars to build a road through Shenley Park for privately run shuttles for a development to connect to CMU. That's money you could use <laughs> to expand bus service. And I, I don't, I mean, again, I, I'm not the expert here, but there needs to be a way for that money, <laughs> I think, to be moved to practical bus service and away from these sort of fancy projects, you know, that, uh, that come with a big gala and ribbon cutting ceremony. Well, and, and another kind of key issue for us is our maintenance base capacity, because even if you gave me 20 more million dollars for additional service, we need to make sure that we've got the support facilities in place to, to be able to, to support that service. And um, so we're at a critical point. Uh, we heard about Harmer Garage, but we've got four garages that are pretty much all at capacity right now. So it's uh, you know, buses are the bread and butter of the service today, and we need to make sure that that continues to be supported. And uh, so one of the pieces we'll be looking at is, do we have adequate maintenance facilities? Do we need to expand that? I would presume the answer is yes. If we hope to have any additional service, we will need additional maintenance capacity. So um, kind of putting some of that into play so that we can provide some of this additional service that we all hope to be able to, to put out there. Okay, great. Well, I hope you get the funding you need. Thank you. <laughs> I think I think from from a planning perspective, um, I know that the the, the mo type was was certainly eye catching in the article. But um, from a planning perspective, it's, it'd be interesting to hear from the public. It, you know, the demand uh, to connect the hill district to the strip district. Um, you know, connecting to shopping and food access. And um, so, regardless of, of what the mode is, it, you know, hearing the c community feedback um, to connect those points of interest will be very beneficial for us. Um, and, and in the long range plan, we may not necessarily be looking at the specific mode, but connecting the dots that need to be connected and then worrying about uh, a mode down the, you know, down the line. But um, it w will certainly be beneficial to hear that demand and, and need to connect uh, the Hill District. Okay. Well, I can also tell you, just generally, Hazelwood and Greenfield would love to be better connected to Oakland Absolutely. via bus service. That, sure. Absolutely. Period. And we've heard, yeah, and we have, That's we've all heard we're that. asking for. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, Absolutely. Anyway, thanks very much. Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, as Jim said, my name is Peter Shank. I'm the uh, Chief Financial Officer of the Port Authority of Allegheny County. Um, and I'm here to talk about uh, potential uh, or to get and listen for potential uh, fair ideas. Um, before I get started, um, I do know that uh, people get very nervous when you start talking about money. So uh, as a, uh, a little story, uh, in, uh, in early December, it was a Sunday morning, and I'm uh, sitting in the... Uh, the church pew, and uh, my minister, Minister Kevin, goes on to say how 40% of the church's budget is due to come in and uh, during the holiday season. And, uh, you know, most of us are sitting in our pew going through the hymnals and, and uh, making sure we read the bulletin and that sort of thing. And as soon as Pastor Kevin mentioned 
uh, that we were short in the budget. I swear everybody went and protected their purse and their wallet. So uh, <clears throat> I do know that there's definitely, uh, we take very seriously when it comes to uh, to how we spend your money. 21%, as Catherine alluded to earlier, comes from the fare box. It comes from uh, our passengers on a daily basis that put in uh, either 250 on a Connect card or they buy a monthly pass for 97.50 or they buy an annual pass um, for over $1,000. So um, I just want to say that thank you for all of, the, all of you that support public transit through your fares. And as Catherine did mention, you also support us through taxpayer dollars. So, and we take it very seriously how we spend those dollars. Uh, all of my <clears throat> comments are going to be uh, directed towards the current funding model. So, uh, as most of you probably know, we operate under Act 89 state legislation. So, a uh, certain amount of our dollars come from the state. The county is also a big uh, benefactor to the Port Authority. And then also, as I said, passenger revenue. So my comments are on the current funding model. If in the future there is any type of a change to the model, you know, whether it's additional funding from any other source of government, we would obviously uh, adjust the, fun the future funding model. But, uh, so when I talk about fares as they currently stand, it's also uh, in terms of how we're financed currently. Um, so just when we start to look at broad themes from a financial perspective, uh, our expenses do continue to increase. <clears throat> our subsidies from the state, county, and, and federal government have increased uh, over the past years, and uh, I'll have a couple slides, but our passenger revenues are uh, basically, I'd say static uh, for the past couple of years. <clears throat> so the principles that we've identified in terms of our fair policy, uh, obviously we want to support the organization with a financial sustainability plan uh, we can't talk about existing service if we can't pay for it. So uh, obviously we want to make sure that <clears throat> whatever future direction we go financially, that it's viable and it can support what we currently have. And then obviously through the long-term vision, if there's talk about additional service, <clears throat> we would have to adjust the financial plan accordingly uh, to support that additional service. The customer service and the experience in terms of how you interact when you pay uh, either on the bus or the rail system or the incline, we want to make sure that it's not unduly cumbersome. <clears throat> and uh, when we changed fares back in January 2017, that was a central theme that we were getting from our passengers was that you know, you had to keep track if you're in zone two, you're zone one. If you're a new rider, <clears throat> you're petrified because you don't want to be embarrassed that you're showing up at the bus stop with 250 and it's really 375. So the central theme was to try to make it simpler <clears throat> and get that, you know, embarrassment factor out. If somebody shows up at a bus stop, it's 250 or 275, depending if you're paying cash or or uh, uh, on the connect card. So the simplicity argument <clears throat> is, uh, was one of the central themes of the January 2017. We also want to make it uh, grow ridership uh, in terms of with our is it existing service. And then obviously, if we add service, uh, a, benef a benefactor to that would be additional ridership as well. <clears throat> uh, also, equity and cost of and access. Uh, we do realize 
that any change we make, we want to make sure that we're uh, listening to the most vulnerable in our neighborhoods. <clears throat> so we take it very seriously in terms of any type of a change that we would propose, that there are going to be people that are going to be impacted by any change in fares. So we are going to definitely be listening to the community in terms of getting your input and hopefully having policies that can uh, assist with the most vulnerable in our communities. Okay. Sorry, watch out. So I d one thing, so I want to stress while Pete is talking, these are the principles which we applied as we start looking at this. If you think we're looking at the wrong things, please let us know. Everything going on on these slides, we need your impact. If you believe that the most important thing to look at is I uh, getting fares recovered through microchips implanted in your thumb, I exaggerate, but if you think that kind of thing should be a guiding principle, let us know. If you think the organization's focus should be much more on equity of access, uh, or maybe codified saying that people should only pay a certain percentage of their income into transportation, give us that feedback. All of this is up for consideration as we go forward. So. I, as we explain it, if, if you think we're missing something, if you want to hear it a little differently, this is the kind of information that we want to hear. Back to Pete. Thank you for letting me know. No, no, it's fine. Um, and I should mention, we do also have survey questions out on the uh, website to get your input uh, even after the Q&A. Uh, we would also, uh, I know you asked a question about fare box recovery, and we do have a slide explaining that, but when we talk about fare box recovery, we're talking about the amount of the operating budget that's supported through fares. So we want to uh, have the a board adopted fare box recovery ratio and uh, hopefully maintain that fare box recovery ratio. Jeffrey is going to talk about some exciting projects we have on the electronic payment. As you know, we have the Connect Card system currently. And I'm not going to steal Jeffrey's thunder, but he has some exciting new projects coming on in terms of fair payment uh, methods. And then finally, in Act 89, <clears throat> there is language in there that talks that we must adopt uh, basic principles for adjusting fares to some metric in terms of uh, consumer price index doesn't, it's rather silent in terms of, it doesn't say you have to adjust your fares to any type of a CPI, uh, you just need a policy. <clears throat> so what are our drivers for exploring uh, new payment options? At many of our board meetings and uh, also uh, some of the committee meetings, we've been listening to the community uh, through when public speaking, uh, public speakers come up <clears throat> and getting ideas and in, input, as Catherine mentioned, uh, maybe something with the current transfer policy. But over the next uh, six to eight months, we're going to be having these meetings in many portions of the county. And we're going to be asking for other ideas besides just the transfer policy uh, that you might have that would uh, tie in nicely with our principles that we just went over on the last slide. What else do the fares go <clears throat> to doing? As I mentioned, they support the current service. And that's almost 63 million rides on an annual basis. It also supports our active employees, which is almost 2,700 <clears throat> active employees. We also have a huge network of retirees, 3,700 uh, retirees out living in the community with their families. So uh, 21 cents of every dollar that goes to supporting uh, those families or retirees <clears throat> uh, goes towards either their, their uh, checks or their uh, pension checks. And as I mentioned on earlier, Act 89 does require some type of a formalized review of our expense structure and in terms of uh, state and county funding and the portion <clears throat> that uh, the passenger would uh, contribute to supporting that service. 
Just as a quick review, uh, our most recent fair change was back in January 2017, and that is when we went from the two-zone system and we went to the one zone of uh, 250 fare on the connect card or 275 using cash. It used to be 375 for zone two, that was eliminated. As you can see, since that, uh, well this is actually since the, the change prior to that January, January 2017, um, in July 2012, which would have been the, the previous fare increase, uh, we've had a CPI increase of about 12%. So finally, in terms of, this is a, a balancing act in terms of the various stakeholder groups uh, that, uh, that we have to get input from. And uh, here are some of the ideas that have been expressed at some of the earlier public engagements, uh, whether at this point mostly uh, board meetings and committee meetings. So as I mentioned, elimination of transfers. Some agencies uh, do have time-based fares. There's also been some calls for expanding the UPASS program, and for those unfamiliar with that, that is the uh, program where uh, college and university students pay on a per tap basis and uh, for the most part <clears throat> that they don't pay uh, directly they're sponsored through uh, their college or university so there's been a uh, um, numerous requests from some of the colleges that are not part of the program to participate <clears throat> in some similar program to what Pitt CMU and uh, uh, Chatham pay. There's also been some uh, uh, comments on coming up with some type of a bulk discount. You know, whether you uh, live in a uh, apartment building where there would be a commitment to buying a certain number of passes on a monthly basis. You know, and as, if there was that commitment, whether there would be some type of a discount. Um, fair capping uh, has been mentioned previously, and what that is, it's, it's kind of a technology solution that, uh, that would have to be incorporated into our current connect card system, where depending on how many times you wrote in a week, it would cap out at whatever the weekly rate is, how many times you wrote in a month, it would cap out at monthly rate, <clears throat> similar type thing, uh, but it would all have to be uh, dependent on uh, a technology investment. Uh, base fare adjustment is on there, employee pass program. Uh, this would be similar, somewhat similar to the bulk discount other than we would be reaching out to um, different job centers and if there was a commitment to purchasing uh, different uh, products over the long term, there, there could be a possibility of some type of a discount if there was that commitment. As I mentioned, some type of a low income program to protect the most vulnerable in our neighborhoods uh, where they would get a discount either directly or maybe through they were working with a social service agency where they could get <clears throat> some type of a discount. And then depending on the long range plan, uh, if there was some improvement with express service where we could, where there were, you know, fewer stops, but you could commit to, you know, the bus getting between point A and point B in a certain amount of time there could be a premium pricing built into that. And then there, I do have on their uh, other revenue sources, we have been looking at things like charging for parking and park and rides, you know, that sort of thing, which wouldn't necessarily impact um, your fare, but obviously if you utilized a park and ride, uh, it would, there could be an impact. 
And I'm not going to really uh, get into a lot of the nuts and bolts other than to say uh, in our current budget, the fare box, as you can see in red there, is about 19% of our $461 million and change uh, operating budget. <clears throat> you can see the fare box on the top there on your top right-hand corner, 89.6 million. And uh, we do have some other sources. Um, I don't know if Karen's still here, but um, the uh, 10.5 million is, is an offset from the state for our access program. Jim Ritchie, who introduced me and is over there, him and his group, um, are successful at getting about two and a half million dollars a year from advertising on vehicles or at stations, that sort of thing. And then we have some uh, miscellaneous revenue, so I won't belabor that. <clears throat> and I'm really not going to belabor this either. It's just to, to answer your question in terms of how did we come up with that 21% in 2019? The passenger contributed about almost 89 million of the 424 million that was spent in last year's operating budget. And uh, this is just a little bit of a synopsis of the past four years and uh, where <clears throat> it kind of depicts that pri in uh, fiscal 16 would have been the last year where we had the two zone and we converted to the one zone and, um, and we projected that we would probably lose money on that change. Uh, we've lost a little bit less than expected, but um, I guess what it signifies is that we are showing more people using the system at 62.6 million. Um, but unfortunately, in terms of the, the passenger revenue amount, it's, um, it's a little bit less than it was. So I think we're going to hold off on Q&A until Jeffrey's done. Can you go back to the fare consideration slide? There we go. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you're talking about the fare consideration slide. Um, and and I apologize for jumping in between my uh, six-year-old has to get a filling, and I get to take him to the dentist. I'm very excited about that. So I will see you guys after uh, my son, who is named Bash, get through the dentist. His name is Bash. That tells you how the day is going to go. Um, I, I wanted to make sure that we're stressing these are some ideas that have been floated to us. We want to get feedback as broadly as possible. Does any of this look interesting to you as a consumer of our services? Are there things we're missing? Do you care how fares go as long as you can be sitting down within three seconds? So tell us what you value. We Again, we've had a fare consultant come in. They've looked at our fare structure. They've looked at our peers' fare structure. They've identified things that could make it easier for folks to ride, could um, be employer pet programs that would get revenue that would help us continue to come into the system and folks would not be paying at the fare box. They'd already be covered. Uh, we just we need to get your input on what this means and what this would be useful for you. Again, based on that, we'll go back to these consultants and ask them to help us move to the next step. But without hearing from you, we can't go forward. So if this doesn't work, give us other ideas. Give us every idea. And you know, there's a lot of folks who say we want things to be free. I think we all understand that any dollar that doesn't come in gets replaced, right? So I don't hear free, I hear if students want to ride, can we help their school districts decide this is important? Can we help other funders decide this is important? And then students aren't paying at the fare box because that is already covered, does that make sense? And there's other cities in the country that have done this, that have said, you know, if the VA is buying X dollar amounts worth of passes, convert that to a program where veterans can ride. It's paid for, but the veteran isn't paying at the fare box, right? So we want to make sure that we're looking at those options, too, just to make it easier for folks to get on. We know from focus groups that paying fares is very stressful for a lot of our patrons. That they're, What if the Connect card didn't work? What if I don't have an extra whatever? What if I'm riding before 6 in the morning so I couldn't get downtown to reload my, tic my ticket? What if the TVM was broken and so I knew I had a buck fifty and now I only have a dollar something in my hand? What if the operator is giving me the stink eye? We want to make sure that we're addressing those issues, too, so this becomes an easier experience and we take away that stress, right? Um, if you have to lose your dignity to use a service, a service is useless. We want to make sure that we're getting that embedded and we're capturing that. Uh, and I'm now going to turn it over to uh, Jeffrey Devlin 
and I'm going to the dentist. So we'll see you later today. Thank you for coming. Good luck, Bash. Thanks, Pete. So good morning. Uh, so my name is Jeffrey, and I get to rec uh, represent the, the technology that's going on at the Port Authority. As you can imagine, there's all kinds of good stuff going on, crazy different things. Monitors on the buses, knowing when it's running out of windshield washer fluid, all those kinds of things. What I wanted to focus on today is a chance to show you just a couple of the features that we have available to make it easier, whoop, let's get past all this, for uh, the customer experience. And it's, I'm going to talk about two areas in particular. One is how we can track your bus or train when you're out in the system. And the other one is the mobile ticketing application, which we're going to be rolling out later this year. So first off is in tracking your bus and train. We have a new responsive site. It's not quite an app, but if you pull it up on your smartphone, it'll respond to your, your phone and show it properly. And it's truetime.portauthority.org. We just upgraded this again, November, December timeframe. And the really amazing thing about this is that you can look up stop times, you can look at a map and actually enter in the routes that you ride and watch your buses as they move around through the system. There's a trip planner, you can subscribe to get call and text messages of when your bus is coming and you can track by text. So you can get a text message when they're coming in. So if you haven't already used truetime.portauthority.org, I'd highly recommend that you check it out. It is the Port Authority's own service. Now the data that is shown in TrueTime is also shared out through a variety of different feeds so that other apps like the Transit app and Move It and Pat Tracker, et cetera, et cetera, are more than welcome to use that same data. So feel free to use all of those. This is the one that the Port Authority provides. There's another handy tool, and I actually just used this a couple times yesterday. If you're standing at a bus stop and you want to know when the next bus is coming, you can send a text message to number 41411, and in the message you put PAAC and the stop number. The stop number is listed right there at every stop on the sign for the bus. So 4833, I think, is right outside of, uh, on 6th Street there, 6th Avenue, rather. And when you send that message, you'll see on the right-hand side, the system will send back to you when all the next buses are coming for that particular stop. And if it says TT, that means true time, the bus is actually coming at that particular time. And SC means scheduled time, which means it'll be there soon. Or it's scheduled for that time period, TT when it's actually on route. Another aspect, if you're more comfortable sitting at a, at a computer or, or talking with a real person, is to use our online chat with customer service. They're available seven days a week from 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. All you have to do is go to our website, www.portauthority.org, open the chat window in the bottom right corner of the screen, and a friendly agent will get in touch with you, and you can ask them whatever questions you have. They'll help you find when the next bus is coming or answer any other question you have about our service. So customer service is available from 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. in online chat for your services. And then finally, uh, you're standing at the bus station or the, or the T station and you want to know when the next uh, bus or train is coming. We're rolling out some new digital signage. Uh, some of these are already in place and we're at this point now just uh, lighting up the electricity and the activation on them. So over the next couple months, you should start seeing these get activated on the train stations and platforms. All of these are tied together with the same information from our true time that is tracking where the buses are. What we're trying to do is make it as, as available in whatever format you would like to be able to know when that next bus or train is coming. The newest feature, and to our knowledge, we're the first in the nation to actually make this information publicly available. I've not heard from any of my peers that their agencies are doing this. I don't have a pure fact, so I can't put that in bold, but we think we're the first ones to do this. And the idea is, you're standing there looking at our true time map and you want to know how bus that full is that's coming down the street. You can click on any bus as it's coming towards you. It'll show you the next stops and at the bottom of it, it'll show you how full that bus is from plenty of space to moderately full to, sorry, you're going to be standing in the aisle or worse. Uh, the beauty of this is you can then make a decision. If that bus is coming towards you, you can see it's already red over full, then you can potentially look at taking a different route or waiting for the next bus, going to get a cup of coffee, et cetera. 
Mobile ticketing application, as Pete mentioned earlier, uh, we're looking at additional ways that we can help people pay their fare. We know a lot of folks really like the Connect Card. We know some folks have different perspectives about Connect Card. Uh, we know some folks are comfortable with cash. Folks would rather move away from cash if they could. So the mobile ticketing app will be deployed later this year. And basically, just like Uber or Lyft, you'll load an app onto your phone. You can stand on a street corner, buy a ticket right then and there. 12 seconds later, you can be stepping on the bus and validating your fare. So with one of the challenges we have with the Connect card, you have to find a TVM, you have to go on a website, you have to wait for it to get activated, etc. With the mobile ticketing app, just like with any other service, you can just buy your ticket, jump on the bus or train, and keep moving on along your way. So we're at the stage right now, we just installed 50 validators on uh, some buses at our Collier and Ross garages. Next month, we'll start doing our intern and testing on those validators to make sure that they work properly, to make sure the transactions flow, et cetera. In a few months, we'll get more validators on the system. We'll be able to have a public engagement process where we can have uh, more folks from the public actually test out these apps, make sure it works the way you think it should work, if there's changes we should make on the button flow and the messaging, et cetera, and then we can eventually roll it out further and further from that point. So we're very excited at this because it gives us great opportunities for ways of people who want to pay their fare in different means and aren't quite comfortable putting a digital chip in their thumb, as Catherine mentioned earlier. See, so. the company uh, Masabi is based out of London. They're testing it right now in Europe. And when the banking system here in the States catches up to be able to use NFC consistently, then they'll be able to activate that uh, with our system also. So the validators are built in to handle both QR code and NFC. Yep, spot on. I had several concerns about, uh, the first one was about how the uh, reporting for the uh, service stations along the 88 and 48 along that website program that we have to the survey. Uh, I, it only takes one bus route and one stop at a time. So if I'm, if I'm a rider and for instance, I, I do take the 48 and I have taken the 88 as well, and uh, both of those routes at different times of the year I use frequently. I'm concerned about multiple stops on, the, on those, at least about eight or 10 of them on each of them. I have to, I'm told I have to go through that app, that survey, a total of, I'm concerned with at least 10 on one and 10 on the other, 20 times in total to get the appropriate feedback. Why can't I select the line, select how many stops, and why can't I also see crosswalks um, and traffic lights? Because without knowing where those markers are, as a, uh, as a rider, I would love to have you know, a bus stop where, at a crosswalk as well. But I can't see that if, if it's not on the technology map itself. So yeah, are there your ways of addressing you. that? You Yes, yeah, so I'm going to defer to Philip. Yeah, we, um, I'd love to talk to you about what we could do better uh, to get that information out uh, regarding uh, stop consolidation. So any feedback you have, I'd love to talk to you about that. Thank you. OK, thank you. I had a question about if we have any idea yet if the testing for this new uh, app and system is going to be conducted in a similar fashion to back when some of us got to connect to test the connect bands. In a fashion, yes. Um, what we're doing now is doing our internal testing to make sure that the hardware actually works. Once we're sure with that, we'll let Masabi install more validators. Mm -hmm. Then we'll put out a public request for folks who are interested in testing the apps um, All right, in, a, in a limited fashion. Yes. Uh, 
real quick with the gentleman that is here. I apologize if I took 15 minutes, but I was bringing a lot of vital stuff up that needed. Um, to trim this down, um, on the Facebook page that we are on, um, one of our major concerns are with the overlapping of the 266 monthly trips with the six outline transit systems that are overlapping their work from downtown here out. Um, David Ford, who worked for Westmoreland hey, Jim, Transit. Jim. Uh, no names? Okay. No, no, we're talking finance. Correct. Correct. Affairs. Correct. Um, with what I've been pushing to better transportation, to get less vehicles off the highways onto mass transit and inner city lines. What is Port Authority, SPC, and the rest of our oversight committee members doing statewide with our federal and state legislators to work on setting up hubs, transfer points, so that we could wean the overlapping off of your work, so that when you push buses out to, let's say, Trafford, Harrison. Hey, Jim, to, I'm going to cut you off because that's more long range planning conversation, right. and I'm going to ask you to maybe deal with that one on one after the meeting, okay? Thank you. Does anyone else have a question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. In regards to fares and fare boxes, mm -hmm. um, from what I see, there now I I began my my journey with Port Authority as uh, and a citizen in Erie, and then came here to Pittsburgh, and Pittsburgh's been my home for over five years now. Um, so I see where visitors may have to use a fare box. I get that. However, fare boxes do take a great amount of time, money, and resources out of availabilities. If we took away the fare boxes and did the suggested plan that you have with the app, because even though I live in HACP housing, I, I know everybody in, in my building has got a smartphone of some sort. It's one thing these days that people make sure they take care of. They either have a cell phone or a smartphone mm -hmm. and, and, or are connected to somebody who has, has it. That, that is a great idea to have the uh, card on the phone. I think that's brilliant. I think that that would work so well. It's also unfair in a sense for what I think makes it, well, before I get to the unfair part, I think it's great because if you're a visitor, you're not going to have to worry about uh, making sure that you hit uh, Smithfield and six in order to get you know your ticket your ticket will be right available there on your phone there won't be a need anymore for uh fare boxes technically and that's a good thing that's money and resources that can go into redevelopment i think and there are people that are still doing cash that quite frankly uh, it's not just about slowing down the system it it's also about um, some people try to misuse the the system from doing the cash. And I see that a lot of my, my north side routes. I live on north side. Uh, and we shouldn't allow that kind of thing to happen. Take a stand yeah. and, yeah, and um, be able to go forward with it. Thank you very much for the comment. Um, and I mean, I would agree with you that uh, definitely in the future that, that uh, when we get 100% uh, smartphone penetration that maybe that would be something that uh, we can entertain. In the short term, any type of a fair analysis has to go through a Title VI analysis. So we have to look through at our policy, at any type of change in policy, and make sure that um, it doesn't uh, unduly impact by uh, um, ethnicity or by uh, income level. So. Uh, I would say in the in the short term that that uh, cash will always be part of of the system um, maybe at some point uh, and the federal government has to sign off on this title six analysis so maybe at some point the rules and regulations would change and we would be able to show that 
cash is not, uh, that the elimination of cash doesn't have an adverse impact on certain areas of the community. But to be clear, we're not doing that now. No, no, yeah, to oh, be no. clear, we're not doing that now. <laughs> yes. And the, the, the mobile app is really just an additional means for folks to pay. We have to have that fare box on there for those who want to pay with cash and want to use their Connect card. Those are staying intact as they are. The mobile app makes it easier for folks, like you said, who are coming in from out of town or wanting to use the incline and just want to buy a ticket quickly. Absolutely. So. Hey, how are you doing? Good, are you? When it comes to those paper connect cards in the um, in a smartphone, I'm not sure what those things are made of from the standpoint of, you know what I'm saying, what makes it work as far as, you know what I'm saying, just um, AI, but my smartphone wind up killing those paper cards. I'm not sure how that actually functions, or if there's like a warning when it comes to that stuff, but it actually does make those things obsolete. Make the tickets obsolete. Well, I mean, I had like one of those little yeah. sliding cases. Yeah. And I just, I, I put like my paper cards back there. Yeah, and they okay. were back there for probably like a good, let's say, month or probably close to a month. And after a while, when I took it out of the um, back of the phone case and tried to use it, I might as well have mm. been using like a piece of paper. Piece of paper it it yeah. didn't read anything. Yes. It didn't read, use, or anything. Yeah, there actually is a technology, I'll call it a chip, built into those paper tickets. And it could get demagnetized through some source. So. Okay. I would advise not, A, not to keep that many of them in stock. Yeah, I would, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and B, evidently they, they can be. Yeah. I, can, I can have it checked on. I hadn't heard of that before this. No, it, so. it surprised me because when I went to try yeah. to use that thing, I went over the, uh, the orange pad. It just yeah. it didn't read anything. Yep. So. It, it probably demagnetized the chip inside there somehow. Well, yeah. Good. Thanks for the info. Anybody else? No. Oh. Hi. I just wanted to say, so in, in terms of fares, I, I saw that you um, had on your list of considerations um, lower fares for low-income families, mm -hmm. people. Um, I would say that you could do no fares for low-income people. I think that would that's something that many cities are doing. I understand that's not necessarily a possibility for all riders, yeah, yeah. like it is in, a, in some other cities, mm -hmm. but that would definitely be a place to start. Um, and maybe something to consider would be, um, you, you know, if you are not one of those low-income riders mm -hmm. getting a free fare, yeah. higher fares for certain routes, for example, going downtown, I mean, even if it was $5 to go downtown, and, you know, it's $13 for an Uber, so it's still a better deal, and you don't have to pay for parking. Um, at, at any rate, I mean, that's sort of, because of course, but but again, it's like the chicken and the egg. I mean, to increase ridership, you have to increase service. Yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah, yeah, so yeah, I guess I was also wondering if, and again, it's always difficult because of these separate budgets, you know, like mm -hmm. Pat is this and that, you know, but again, if, if, if these, if this money pot could somehow come together, it seems to me that there would also be ways to, um, put some of the burden of financing public transit onto the drivers, especially the drivers who are coming into the city from outside to go to work, et cetera. But again, you'd have to give them the transit options. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure this is what you're thinking about, but. Yeah, well, I appreciate the comment on the low income, especially, and please fill out the survey. Um, I mean, we're, we're open to any suggestion right now, and um, certainly if, if um, I, we just put on there, you know, a discount for low income, but it certainly hasn't been um, discussed or even modeled out in terms of, you know, whether it's half price, 75%, 10% or whatever for a low income program. I mean, there's um, where Mr. Huffaker's from in Seattle, I believe they've, they've recently, uh, uh, embarked on such a program and so we're going to get input from any agency that you know would have already uh, broken that that ground or whatever but I appreciate the the information you think social service agencies already did that uh, well, I mentioned that before okay. I'd like to touch on the low income uh, because I live in a low income high-rise myself 
and I have green card, uh, connect card. And so I get I get half fare because I'm I'm on Medicare, I'm disabled, I have epilepsy, lupus SLE and a few other things. Uh, and right now I pay fifty dollars a month, roughly. And to put this into rough figures, times twelve. So that's fifty dollars every month for a year. That's six hundred dollars that comes out of my social security, my limited income per year so that I, I, have to, I have to be able to get to my doctors. I have to be able, and let's face it, you guys are a lot cheaper than Uber. Uh, <laughs> so obviously you've got that, that going for, for uh, Port Authority being the lowest on, on there. We will, over all other things, utilize you first. The incentive would have to be bigger than 50% off in order for like a HACP card, for instance, begin with all the housing authority of the city of Pittsburgh. It would be at least, uh, I don't know off the top of my head, but roughly about 20 to 30 buildings in the neighborhood of, and those residents, including my building for that matter, could actually be utilized as your first base. Most of them are han handicapped. Uh, so you could also get feedback on the handicap situation. But I would love to see like a HACP card maybe offering like the, the last uh, commenter said, 75% off because we're going to need, if you, you put out something out there that says 50% off for HACP and I'm also on uh, Medicare and I get the get my green half air card, uh, what's the, what difference is it going to make which program I, I'm on, but if you make it greater for me to be on the low income program, I won't have to have a green one. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, and we definitely are empathetic. Um, I'm not sure your first name, but I know Ms., Mr. Love has mentioned, you know, that his, his monthly um, income, what is it? Mm. Oh, thank you. Um, so that's why we are uh, doing this outreach to get input on any type of a change, if there is any type of a change to the fare structure and um, empathetic to those that um, are least able to afford paying the fare. 